growing all the time. In fact, it's one of those areas where I think prices are actually coming down because so many people are uh, getting involved in it now. Uh, but it kind of brings up a question about uh, just, uh, and, and we see all of these uh, celebrities that are uh, involved with uh, beauty and the obsession that some youth has. It brings up the question of just, you know, why are we obsessed and how important is it? And uh, there's a new book out called Awakening Beauty, an illustrated look at mankind's love and hatred of beauty. Dr. Anthony Napoleon is our guest. And good to have you with us today, Doctor. Nice to be with you. Uh, you know, in looking at this whole topic, I remember uh, uh, reading Dr. Maxwell Maltz's books uh, uh, way back 20, 25 years ago when he sort of looked at psychology and uh, of beauty and the fact that some people wanted to alter themselves physically but it didn't always help because there were a lot of emotional issues. So I, I think the, this all kind of looks, uh, goes into that too, does it not? It does. Elective aesthetic surgery, that means cosmetic surgery that you choose for no other reason. You're not trying to improve your breathing or uh, assist your body to function better. Is always, it's 100% motivated by psychological reasons which suggests that we human beings are intimately involved and very much uh, uh, involved with how our bodies look. And we get a great deal of ego gratification. Um, our sexuality is wrapped up with how we look and there is significant basis in fact for those feelings and i think that's the that's the new insight i think that um, we've learned um, certainly since the the uh, late 1980s yeah and it, and it has a change and really it um, it trends in all ages too uh, both uh, very young people and actually older people now too doesn't it well, here's what's fascinating about that. If you look at the research data, and, and let me say something about the research data. In the late 1960s, um, researchers in social psychology and clinical psychology began to take this subject seriously. And I might say that myself personally became involved in this research as a naysayer uh, at an honor, in an honors thesis at Indiana University. Um, my supervisors and I decided that uh, this was bunk and that we were going to demonstrate using uh, pristine methodological techniques that we were going to undermine the prior research. And uh, lo and behold, I walked out of my first research project at a uh, major mental health po hosp uh, hospital uh, being a believer. And um, it set me about on a course of uh, research. Getting back to your question about all ages. Here's an interesting research study. You can take kids 18 hours old, 18 hours, I said, and you can put in front of them photographs of attractive people and unattractive people. And when the children are allowed to see, you have to get it very, very close to them, by the way, their eyes don't focus at 18 hours. When they look at the attractive photographs, they smile, and they coo, and they become open. And when they look at the unattractive photographs, they cry, and they close up. Now, that's, that's less than a day old. And when you research what is attractive, you know, there is this myth that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And there's really nothing uh, further from the truth, because certain parameters of beauty are consistent across the planet. Symmetry, for example, is always judged to be more beautiful than is asymmetry. But when you look at the human being less than a day old to the human being 110 years old, it's the same. And that's shocking. It's also shocking, at least it was to me when I discovered this, that cross-culturally, although there are some differences, Mercy tribes like to put to what we Western world describe as saucers in their lower lip, and we don't think that's pretty. But the Mercy think certain facial proportions, they think certain waist-to-hip ratios, perimeter area ratios, issues related to symmetry, lucidity, etc. 
are all identical to what we here in the Western world think are beautiful. So it's absolutely fascinating. Well, it, it, that really is, and uh, it it also may say that as you get older, you may uh, suppose you maybe are attracted to someone that maybe a lot of people would not call attractive. Maybe that's a conditioning thing. What happens when you get older? So it's, that's a very interesting question. What happens when you get older? And you'll know this yourself that you still look at the world through youthful eyes and that you're as amazed as anyone that you've turned into your father or that you don't look the same way. Um, it, it, it's, it's amazing because self-image comes vis-a-vis the mirror and an internal conception. We all know individuals who um, have a warped sense of how they look. Some of us feel that we are much less attractive in our minds than we really are. And many more of us in the Western world believe we are more attractive than we really are. And then some people have the combination. Some people are insecure, that self-image in their brain, and yet behave as though they are more attractive. And what happens when we get older, when we choose individuals who are not particularly beautiful, real life reorders and modifies our sense of perspective such that men might say, you and I over a beer might say, I'll say, you know, Bob, listen, she's a beautiful woman. And Bob might say to Dr. Anthony, yes, Dr. Anthony, she's absolutely stunning, but you know what? What's more important than beauty? Somebody I can trust, Dr. Anthony. See? Or someone that will be loyal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, 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 that's be- and it's not because Bob or Dr. Anthony have changed their values on what is attractive. We still like attractive, but we understand that there's a lot more to this story than just visual image. When when Bob and Dr. Anthony were 25, maybe Bob and Dr. Anthony didn't have that insight. And I might say, Bob, that insight, most of us learn the hard way. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Most well, of it, that's also, right. Also, that, that young uh, 18... Um, 18 hours old, a baby doesn't, has not learned that yet. That's either. exactly right. The baby doesn't know that. And the baby doesn't understand. And, you know, marketing people and the movie business and anyone who the purveyor of beauty, and that's almost everyone these days, understands that we human beings are easy marks for that which is beautiful. So that if I want to sell aspirin, I'll hire a beautiful actor or model to either stand with or talk about the aspirin. And beauty is so powerful that I am more likely to buy aspirin if a beautiful person is selling it. So we are overwhelmed, we are bombarded, we are manipulated because this is um, almost foolproof. Um, it's almost impossible for most younger people to see past beauty. Beauty is intoxicating, and it does. It takes a little bit of age under the belt. That's why I begin my book with two songs. Uh, one by Jimmy Soul, When You're in Love with a Beautiful Woman, and then the other one is, if you want to be happy for the rest of your life, make an ugly woman your wife. And I put that in tongue-in-cheek, but only to, not to espouse my own per- personal philosophy, rather to illustrate that this factor, the beauty factor, has permeated all of our lives, our biological lives, our psychological lives, our, our spiritual lives. You know, you know, beautiful, attractive ministers and rabbis are easier to listen to. Now, that shouldn't necessarily be, should it? But that's a fact. should be the message. 
Yes, and, and the me- and the me- 